you might think best ball is over now that the fantasy regular season is coming to an end, but you would be sorely mistaken, my friend. Things are just getting started thanks to Underdog's playoff best ball format. It's one of the most unique and fun formats in all of fantasy, and there's a huge edge in just understanding the rules and the basic structure of these unique contests. And today, I'm going to give you 10 tips and tricks to help you crush these drafts and win the big prizes on Underdog Fantasy. Number one, you need to remember that you are not drafting a traditional best ball team. There are lots of differences to both the roster settings and the overall tournament structure compared to the drafts you were used to this summer. The first main difference is you're not drafting 18 players anymore. We're not going 18 rounds here. We're going just 10 rounds. And instead of drafting against 11 other opponents in a 12 person draft, you're now drafting against five other opponents in a six person draft. So six persons in each one of these drafts, 10 rounds, 60 players getting drafted. And of course, the roster settings are a little different here as well. Each week in this contest, you'll be fielding a lineup with five starting spots. That's one QB, one running back, two wide receivers slash tight end. That's a key distinction here. There's not a separate tight end position for the playoff best ball format. They're lumped in with wide receivers. And then there's one flex. So that means you could start up to two running backs each week, one in the running back spot, one in the flex, or you could start up to three wide receivers slash tight ends, two in the wide receiver slash tight end spot, one in the flex. And because of this dynamic, you're always gonna wanna be drafting more wide receivers than running backs. And while there are lots of different permutations that you can viably do, my preferred construction is generally one to two quarterbacks, specifically two quarterbacks if one of your quarterbacks has the bye in the wild card round, and we'll get more into that in a bit. Two to three running backs. I wanna be lean here at running backs, and I want my running backs to ideally be on the teams I'm projecting to go very far in the contest, the Super Bowl teams ideally. And then I'm happy to have five to six wide receiver slash tight ends. You're gonna need lots of wide receiver tight end firepower to advance out of each of these rounds. Number two, understand the rules and the structure of this contest. I was just mentioning that there are various rounds to this tournament. And essentially what happens is there's a round for each of the playoff weeks, right? So we have the wild card round, we have the divisional round, we have the conference championship round, and we have the Super Bowl round. And what's unique about this contest compared to say the best ball mania or traditional best ball regular season, instead of it being cumulative points for say weeks one through 14, each one of these rounds is essentially its own miniature tournament and the points reset each week. So you have to advance out of the wild card round into the next round. Then you need enough points in that round to advance to the conference championship. And we'll pull up on the screen here how this advancement structure works. And look, some of these tournaments differ, but for the most part, Underdog has a similar structure. And the ones I'm gonna share today are for the Gauntlet, which is the flagship tournament up on Underdog right now. It's $25 to enter. There's a $150,000 top prize. In this structure here, the wild card round, the top two out of six teams advance here. And this is notable because last year, it was just the top one team out of six. So it's actually a little easier to advance. And if you advance to round two, the divisional round, you're now in a grouping of 14. And the top two out of that 14 will move on to round three, which is of course the conference championship round. In this round, the top team out of eight in this pod will advance to the 400 person final for the Super Bowl matchup where all of the money can be won. There are prizes for all of the teams who advance at various stages, but the majority of the prize pool is going to the 400 finalists in the Super Bowl. Number three, if you're playing these contests, you absolutely have to be playing for first. And if you're playing for first, you're playing for the Super Bowl matchup. That's where all of the money is going, specifically to the top 10 finishers in these contests. In the gauntlet specifically, one third of the overall prize pool goes to the top 10 finishers. So the takeaway here is you can't play scared. You can't draft multiple quarterbacks just trying to get out of round one. No, no, no. You have to draft a team that if it gets to the Super Bowl, can not only feel the starting lineup, but has enough firepower to beat 
out 399 other teams. And we are gonna talk about some ways you can do that. But the number one thing you need to remember is you can't draft scared. A lot of your opponents in this contest, they're gonna play scared. They're gonna wanna draft extra quarterbacks. They're gonna wanna draft a one-off guy from another team to help them advance. But none of that matters unless you have a juggernaut that you show up to the finals with. Number four, solve for this equation. We now know the crux of the contest, right? We know all of the money is in the final week, the Super Bowl week, where 400 entries in the gauntlet will compete for that top $150,000 prize. But we also know that the scoring isn't cumulative and the scores reset each round. So essentially, the riddle we are solving for is we need enough firepower to get out of the wild card round, to get out of the divisional round, to get out of the conference championship round while still showing up to the Super Bowl with a starting lineup. Now that might seem hard, but there's one simple thing we can do to accomplish this goal. And this is to concentrate our bets, the players we select on a core group of teams. Because what we are trying to do essentially is not draft the best individual players, right? If you take Justin Jefferson and he goes for 30 points in round one, but the Vikings lose, your team might advance, but guess what? You're down to nine players and you're gonna show up in that divisional round and have to compete against a ton of teams that have 10 players, which means they're going to have better odds to advance to the next round. So our goal should be to concentrate our bets around three to four teams who we think can make it to the conference championship round because that means you'll have enough ammo at each step of the way to advance while also showing up to the conference finals with ideally 10 players on your team and then getting to the Super Bowl with at least five players to fill a starting lineup. Number five, tell a story with all of your drafts. When you go into these drafts, you should basically be thinking about a certain playoff scenario once you start picking players. You don't need to predetermine it. You don't want to go into a draft and saying, I'm playing this as if the Niners face the Dolphins in the Super Bowl. No, you want to be flexible to what happens in the first couple of rounds. But after that, you want to use those players to play out a scenario. So for example, if you take Christian McCaffrey 101, and he is a great 101 pick, the Niners have the best odds to make the Super Bowl, you now want to draft the rest of your team as if the Niners are going far, at the very least to the conference championship game. So the second you take CMC, when you're coming back in the second and third round, you're looking to grab a Brock Purdy, maybe a Brandon Ayuk or Debo Samuel fell. At the very least, maybe a Brock Purdy fell, but you want to build out your bet on the Niners. I used that example of Justin Jefferson early because there are going to be good one-off players sitting there available. And you might say, holy cow, I want to take a Monroe St. Brown. But if you've already built out a large bet on the Niners to go far, a Monroe doesn't factor into that. Now, the key here is not to forever write off taking one of these fallers that are star players on perhaps teams with not great odds to make the Super Bowl. The lesson is to lean into it. You can take a Monroe St. Brown, just don't take a Monroe St. Brown by himself. Because if the Lions go far, if a Monroe St. Brown is a key contributor to your success, guess what? Other Lions likely are as well. So the distinction here is once you make a bet on a player, you want to look to build out that bet on the rest of their team. So if you get an Amon Ross St. Brown faller, maybe you want to grab David Montgomery. Maybe you want to grab Sam Laporta. Maybe you're at the very end of your draft and you want to grab a Josh Reynolds or a Jamison Williams. The point here is push your chips in on specific teams. Don't get caught up saying, hey, Amon Ross St. Brown projects for way more than than let's say Justin Watson. Because I'm telling you right now, if Amon Ross St. Brown plays one game and Justin Watson plays four games for the Chiefs, Justin Watson is going to outscore and be more valuable than Amon Ross St. Brown in this contest. So stop thinking about individual players and think about team level correlations being your North Star while drafting this contest. Number six, stay focused with your roster construction. Now, there's lots of different ways you can slice and dice these rosters. You have players from the AFC, you have players from the NFC. We know our number one goal is to have at least five players in the Super Bowl. But how I like to think through my roster construction is building around the four teams that could make it to the conference championship, which often means that I have two 
uh, AFC teams as part of a draft and two NFC teams. I rarely will explore more than that because I'm wanting to concentrate my bets on those four teams and then have enough players in the Super Bowl to field that starting lineup. But because of the way the roster settings works and having access to both AFC and NFC players is you can mix and match this in a variety of ways. You could theoretically draft five Dallas Cowboys and five Jacksonville Jags players and say, you know what? What if it is a Jags and Dallas Super Bowl and I'm gonna have all the best players on both of these teams? And then you basically just need to hope that they score enough points in each round between the two of them to get you there. Another way you could do it is you could take four players from one conference. Say you get the Niners uh, stack, although it's really hard to do, but as an example, as a hypothetical, say you had CMC, Brock Purdy, um, let's do it more realistic, and George Kittle, and then Jawan Jennings. You tacked on a guy late. So you have four Niners. Now you could take two sets of three from the AFC. Maybe you grab three Dolphins, you grab Raheem Mostert, uh, Jalen Waddell, and you grab Jeff Wilson Jr. late. And then you also grab three Browns players who have really good odds to make the playoffs right now. You grab Amari Cooper, you grab David Njoku, and you grab Jerome Ford, something like this. But the point is you're mixing and matching. And the one thing you need to really think through is your quarterback has to be playing in the Super Bowl, right? If you show up to the Super Bowl with a lineup and your quarterback isn't there, you're already dead on arrival because other people will show up there with the quarterback playing in the Super Bowl. And then tied to that, you ideally want your running back to also be on one of the teams that go super far. Because one, you're gonna need a running back in the Super Bowl, but also you don't wanna be spending a lot of draft spots on running back. So I love the idea of pairing my quarterback and running back from the same team. If I have Dak Prescott, I'd love to have Tony Pollard. If I have CMC, I'd love to have Brock Purdy. If I have Gus Edwards, I'd love to have him with Lamar Jackson. Now, there are many different permutations. If you wanted to do four players from one side with the quarterback and then do three sets of two from the uh, opposing conference, that's completely viable. There's lots of ways to mix and match, but the most simple rule I could say is have your quarterback be on the team that you're playing to go to the Super Bowl and then try to have your other pieces from the other conference and whatever you do, you just wanna make sure you're not concentrated on more than say four teams. If you're picking five teams, that means at the very least, one of your players will not be available in the conference championship round. And again, I'm telling you, when you get to the conference championship round, four teams will be left and people in your group in the underdog contest will have all 10 players available. And the second you remove one of those players from your team down to nine, you have less of a chance to win. So always remember that you can mix and match the 10 players in a variety of ways, but make sure it's concentrated on four teams who could realistically make the conference championship games. All right, tip number seven, and this is very, very important. Don't tilt when you get sniped. Now these contests are really unique and it's a double-edged sword. The good part is there's lots of bad players in these contests. There's lots of people who aren't watching this video who don't understand how to properly draft this contest. They're gonna do things like take a second in a third quarterback. That is bad allocation of resources in these contests. You want to maximize your scoring. And the best way to do that is with one quarterback. But a lot of people don't understand that. And you might be sitting there, you got Jalen Waddle, you got Tyree Kill, you got Devon A. Chan, you're just waiting for Tua to come back to you. And guess what? The guy with Jalen Hurts also grabs Tua. That is something that is going to happen in these drafts. I'm telling you right now. And yes, when it happens to you the first few times, it sucks. It's not fun. You feel like your entry is ruined, but you can't give up. You always have flexibility to pivot. Maybe you had been building out that Niners Dolphins thing. You got sniped on Tua. Well, now it is time to pivot to another team. Find a quarterback. It might not seem like Joe Flacco can make it to the Super Bowl. I get that, but you can still build a logical lineup that would make you live to win $150,000. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do here. Obviously, the Dolphins and Tua have a better probability of making it to the Super Bowl and winning money. But just because someone snipes your quarterback doesn't mean you give up on that draft room. And the best way I would think about it, it's like when you play poker, right? And if you have pocket aces and some doofus at the table sits down with 7-2 offsuit and he pushes all in and cracks your aces, 
you will be so livid. How did you play that hand? What did you do? But don't you want to play against that guy long term? Isn't the guy who shoves it in with 7-2 the exact kind of guy you'd like to play lots with? That's the same dynamic with these tournaments. There's going to be bad drafters. They're going to upset you, but you need to embrace it. Do multiple reps, get multiple drafts in, be flexible, be willing to pivot on the fly, and just know, on the whole, as part of your portfolio, you are gonna build teams that have the potential to compete for first place. Number eight, be flexible, because the playoff picture is constantly changing. I'm recording this video right now after week 15, but the playoff picture will change after week 16, after week 17, and it will finally get solidified after week 18. What that means is that the optimal strategy for drafting these teams and the optimal players to target is literally going to change each week. And the best way to take advantage of that is to draft continuously after each of these shifts and make sure you're making the best possible decisions. If you go all in on a single strategy, say you went all in on the Baltimore Ravens to the Super Bowl, but you were selecting a lot of Keaton Mitchell. Well, guess what? He's done for the year now, and now you need to reshift your strategy. You need to build out more Lamar Jackson teams that have Gus Edwards instead of Keaton Mitchell. And that's one of the benefits of this contest being open for so long, is that players' values are going to fluctuate. A couple weeks ago, the Bills were barely being drafted. Now now that they're winning games, they're moving up the ADP board. So it really is a fun contest. Get in, do a couple each week, and take advantage of the new things that are a part of that playoff picture. And the other thing this allows you to do is to think about all of your teams you're drafting from a portfolio standpoint and understanding you don't want to go all in on one playoff scenario. Even if I think the Niners are going to the Super Bowl, I still would not want to draft every single one of my teams as if the Niners were a final team. Because what happens if they have one bad injury, one surprise upset, your entire portfolio is wiped out. Instead, let the draft room dictate you to certain teams. You know, if you don't have the 101 and CMC goes and then Ayuk and Debo go, you shouldn't be taking, you know, George Kittle with your first round pick just because you like the Niners. No, that's a time to pivot to another team who has a high likelihood of advancing. Maybe you grab Tyreek Hill there. I'm not even the biggest Tyreek Hill believer, but the second, or sorry, I should say Dolphins believer. But when I select Tyreek Hill, I want to build out a team as if the Dolphins and Tyree Kill are going to go far. And so that's what I mean by don't get tethered to your personal takes of these teams are going to the conference championship, these teams are going to the Super Bowl. It's fine to have those, but sometimes the paths to drafting the teams you like won't be there and you'll need to pivot and you'll still want to build logical teams around the players you selected early in your draft. Number nine, you have to plan for the bye weeks. Now this is one of the most unique wrinkles to this contest, right? The two teams that are most likely to make it to the Super Bowl are the teams who have the bye weeks, right? They have to play one less game. They get to host two home games. But those players in this contest also don't score for our teams in round one. So the key here is when we take players on teams who are projected to get the bye, we have to cover our bases. But we have to cover our bases in a smart way. If you take Brock Purdy in the second round, I would not just immediately grab another quarterback right after him because what's going to happen is you're going to have less firepower at the other positions. Essentially, you're taking a zero in one of your spots in round two when both of those guys are healthy, one of those valuable spots. So the ideal way to do it with the quarterback, if you're covering your bases, is to wait until much later in the draft and then get a player, ideally on the opposite side of the conference of that quarterback, who is for sure going to play in round one and can essentially just score you enough points to then let you start using Brock Purdy in round two. So in the AFC, it could be a Trevor Lawrence, it could be a Joe Flacco, a quarterback on one of these teams who we know is gonna be in the playoffs and who we know is going to play in round one. And the more players you draft on a team who has the bye, the more round one firepower you're going to need. And this often necessitates that you need to push the chips in on a less desirable team in the AFC. You might say, oh great, I'll just load up on the Dolphins uh, with my Niners. Well, guess what? Other people like the Dolphins too. It's hard to get enough Dolphins to pair with the Niners and have enough firepower to advance. That's why I mentioned other secondary teams like the Jags and the 
Browns. So you want to think through this from two viewpoints, right? You need points to make up for the bye week players, but if you spend too much on those points, you're going to have a really weak team in round two. Number 10, get some reps. This is true of anything in life, but specifically with playoff best ball, practice does make perfect. It can be disorienting hopping in these drafts at first. You got players valued all over. You got five other drafters who are doing crazy things. You're trying to build out team bets, but also trying to place that into ADP. It can be overwhelming. I get it. But the best thing you can do is hop into some of these drafts, get the lay of the land, and you'll slowly and slowly get more comfortable. And one of the nice things here is Underdog has these contests at all different price points. For this video, I was focusing mainly on the gauntlet, which is the $25 contest with a $150,000 top prize, but they have $5 tournaments. They have some smaller tournaments where you can only put in 20 entries max instead of 150. And you can go and get some reps at a lower price point and feel really comfortable about what you're doing. And I promise you, once you dive in and start doing these, you will have so much fun that you'll want to be doing more because you start to see the playing field. You start to see the board. You start wanting to say, hey, I want to get this combo. I want to get some dolphins with cowboys. I don't have that yet. Oh, I want to try to get some eagles with chiefs. I don't have that yet. And you'll get more and more familiar, but really getting the reps is the most important thing. And even if you don't want to spend the $5 on a mitten to get a practice rep, you can go look at the ADP. You can build out teams that would make logical sense. Sketch them out. Say, if I had a first round pick here, this is who I would take. If then I went down to my second round pick based on who would be available, there's all kinds of different ways you can plot it out in practice. But with this format, it really is crucial to get some reps in, and then you'll be able to benefit from other drafters who hop in and don't have quite the lay of the land as you do. All right, guys, good luck in your playoff best ball drafts. If you want to review some of the concepts that we discussed in this video, there is a written version of this video up on the site, fantasylife.com. Also, hopefully be doing some updated playoff best ball strategy around specific teams once the playoff odds solidify. You can keep an eye out for that. And as always, subscribe to the channel. Make sure you turn those notifications on so you don't miss any other videos. I'll see you in those playoff best ball streets.